first, I'm from Red Hat. I was actually one of the founding members of OpenShift, which is sort of a new space for us as a company. But my background was IT. I've actually spent about the last decade or so in a bunch of different uh, varying levels of pain IT gigs. And so for me, I think 2011 has been one of the most interesting years that I've seen in a long time. So how many people, just out of curiosity, are familiar with infrastructure as a service, if I say that term? Or... Okay, good. That's, uh, I, was, I have to go back too far there. But I mean, for, for me, looking at the, the number of cloud services that are out there now and the actual power of them, if you look at to the infrastructure as a service offerings that are there today, whether it's Amazon or IBM or Rackspace, they're pretty amazing. And if you look at the pressure that's put on IT organizations, it's it's a little bit painful. I mean, these are, and myself included, we came from like rack and stack data centers, and now you have these public cloud services that can actually do it better and cheaper with a lot more capability than you can probably do it in-house. And from the IT side, that's a little bit painful, but from the development side, it's pretty cool. And so not only are we seeing um, offerings like infrastructure as a service, but you're seeing higher level offerings now called platform as a service, so there's a bunch of different things out there, and the space is just sort of exploding. So for us, I'll go through two things here of actually what we're doing in OpenShift, and then why we use Ruby, and just a little bit of insight to a couple of things that we've done, some services that we use, uh, just things that we think you know really helped us get the offering to where it is. So um, first, though, if we talk about, there we go. So like I said, great year, right? It's actually an exciting year, but if you're stuck on the development side, this is what I sort of feel like sometimes. Uh, there's all this power out there. There's so much stuff that you can use. And yet a lot of times if you're, you're sort of held back sometimes by your either internal or just what is actually sustainable in prod. So development is, it's fun, it's fast, you want to move as quick as you can, but then when you're actually making money or things need to stay and they need to run, you get saddled by a lot of the sustainability pain. Um, so that is where we hope that platform as a service is actually going to help meet those two groups of something that it can be built on operational standards that are good enough that even your existing IT groups are going to like it or they're going to be supportive of it. But then it actually lets you as a developer take advantage of all of this stuff, or at least a lot of this stuff that's out there. So really getting the focus back to development. So in this, I'm going to talk a little bit about Red Hat. Of, this is new. Like most people, how many people actually know what Red Hat is here? I see a lot of Macs, which terrifies me. Okay, fantastic. So I'm a Linux guy. So I'm like, I'm the one poor guy yeah. that's actually running a ThinkPad here. I think I saw one other. But Red Hat, I mean, we're traditionally an operating system company and a middleware system company. What a lot of people don't realize is where we really, what we really focus on is operational stuff. We help keep customers, probably the most complicated environments in the world. It's what we've done over the last decades. We help them get them running, and we help actually keep those things running, whether it's like nasty pushing errata updates to them or making sure the OS is ABI compatible. That's what we've done. So when we talk about platform as a service for us, it's actually taking this stuff that usually, I mean, these are the big banks of the world and stuff that we're working with that run it. And in sort of the movement of cloud, trying to be able to bring that same capability and that same operational power directly to developers. So we want to actually have, be able to provide a great development experience the best we can, but then actually have it carry forward to where it can be a real production environment. Um, real down to the point of whether it's, you know, SLAs around tickets, or it's guaranteed that you're going to be able to get patches all the way through the stack, from your middleware stack to the OS. That's our hope. So that's sort of where we come on platform as a service. So if I look at, if anybody here actually has seen a computer, use a computer that is this old, you might be from the uh, like compile your own kernel community. And just like a little bit of history of what I look at that we want to take off the plate of developers that was really cool 10, 15 years ago. But as the expectations of the business and the, the rate at which we're supposed to move and build offering, it's gotten a little bit uh, challenging. So when you look at where we started, like as a developer, you sort of own the whole stack. I mean, you got the source for something. You actually built your own kernel. If you're like me, 
uh, audio never worked. Like, never <laughs> on your own cradle. Video, you were pretty lucky. Like, that was a good day for me. I was like, holy cow, like, I got this, I can actually see a display. Um, that was big for me. But, and it was a fun time, right? You could actually go, you know, you had complete insight to everything that ran. But you had a lot of stuff on your plate. Once you actually got, like, a kernel that ran, you had to get on the hardware, whatever your group was using. You had to deal with provisioning, infrastructure, security, maintenance, a lot of stuff. Really wasn't sustainable as IT groups were growing so fast. So that's where Red Hat's traditional model was, right? We took the whole, look, we'll deal with the sourcing, we'll deal with upstream communities, we'll pull together a distribution, we'll build it, we'll make it run on a whole bunch of hardware. Audio and video is going to work for you, although, you know, not too many, not a high priority for our customers, but uh, um, we certify it, we do worldwide distribution, we did all that stuff, and we did the support tier in the middle. Which was good, right? It was a really popular thing, made it successful, it's nice. But there is still a lot of stuff on the plate, especially if you're a small shop, you're an engineer, a developer, uh, you still had infrastructure, you still had provisioning, you had to deal with configuration, whether it's CF Engine or Puppet, or you're just changing scripts and prod. You had a lot of stuff on your plate. And it all sort of takes away from end of the day you're trying to develop, you're trying to get work done. So this is what we're hoping, you know, our view when we look at PaaS, it's how much extra stuff can we pull over there to the left? And a lot of this has changed fundamentally in the last couple of years. With the quality of infrastructure as a service offerings that are out there, we actually think we can sort of pull the provisioning aspect and the maintenance of that and the hardware aspects. Now, there are a couple things that we have to share in the middle because we can't do all your configuration for you if you don't know the apps or those things. Uh, security is another tough one. Of, you know, we talk to a lot of people, we can do phenomenal security sort of at the boundary points. But if your app has like a SQL injection problem, like you can't help too much with that. So there are some shared things in the middle along with support, but the goal is really to let people focus again on development. So how can you spend the majority of your day doing the stuff that you like, but then actually have a lot of the operational capabilities that are offloaded um, that you can trust and your IT group and your CI or whoever can trust as well. So with that, this is where my blood pressure spikes, and uh, I try to test my eyes on these small screens. But I am going to show a quick live demo of actually starting a rack application. I want to make sure you guys can actually see this. Read the text pretty well, good. Um, and what OpenShift sort of is. Now I'm going to show you from like the geeky command line interface. That's just what I do. Uh, I'm, one of the old like compile my own kernel guys, so uh, that tends to be where I fall. But we have web tools and those things as well. Um, a little easier to demo on the command line side. So what OpenShift is? I mean, the PaaS space in general, if you know like Cloud Foundry or Heroku or Orchestra or PHP Fog slash App Fog or Engineard, this space is exploding. It's awesome. Like we love watching all the stuff that's done here. So hopefully some of this will be fairly familiar to this group. Uh, but I'll go through fast some my my time here. So uh, I'm going to do some fancy copying and pasting because I know I can't type when I'm doing a live demo. <laughs> so all of our tools, if you actually just install the Ruby gem, and there's sort of two ways to do it. We do do a lot of RPM packaging because a lot of our users are actually on Fedora, they're on this, but uh, probably our second users are all on Macs, like this group here is uh, I think 99% there. So you just install the Ruby gem, has client tools, and all of our client tools you'll just see is RHC dash something. Uh, when you're actually creating something on OpenShift, it has two parts. So one is what we call your domain. It's basically pick that thing in the DNS name that's going to be yours that we're going to create all your apps under. And the second thing is go create all your apps and use them. So um, I'm going to run this. And this is where we start praying about the wireless. Uh, so to talk about what this does. So I'm actually creating an application, that little dash A that's saying my. And the type is going to be a Raft application. We sort of standardize, instead of saying, like, this is a Rails application, we try to sort of standardize to the Raft tier because it lets us run whatever you're going to run underneath that. And we'll switch this to actual Rails application. Um, dash P is just a fancy environment way, so you guys don't have to see me type my super secure password every time uh, I run these commands. But what's happening now is, so this has actually gone out to our cluster of servers. It's, it reserved your DNS name. It propagating that DNS name worldwide. So if you're in like Asia Pacific, it might take a little bit longer to get it than if you're over here. Um, it's gonna wait till that's propagated. It's gonna give you your URL and this should be running. So let's see if, uh, if I copy this. 
switch over here. You guys will see our Hello World application. Hopefully. I gotta do my wireless <coughs> test here. is down for me. One second. I blame this guy over here. He's the one that brought me this little wireless hub. It's been nothing but pain for me. <laughs> we'll see if my Google test starts running here. Um, but that's the goal, right? So you now have basically your running Rack application that's out there. Um, you know, Magic, you didn't have to set up DNS. You don't have to set up, um, you don't have to worry about it being updated or if security errata comes out for uh, Rails or for one of the underlying packages, depending on what gyms you pick, but we're going to apply all that stuff to the server. We're going to deal with basically every operational concern we can. All these things run on Rel, uh, so you actually get all like the ABI benefits and those things of running on Rel, but we have free offerings now for this. So, you know, generally we try to have all of the development use cases available for free. So wireless is back up. So, while that awkward silence, I will show you uh, um, the things I have cached. So, um, if you go to our site, which is openshift.redhat.com, that'll give you a pretty quick walkthrough of how you can go get a username, how you can actually go create this stuff. Um, we try, what we've actually tried to do is keep these environments as native as possible. So, if you were to set this up on your laptop and you were going to run Passenger on your laptop or JBoss or anything else, we want it to be almost identical. So we have snapshotting tools where you can pull down your code, and our goal is, if you're running Fedora or on your Mac or CentOS, it's gonna be the exact same setup, although we do a little multi-homing, um, that you'd run on our servers. So let's see if, uh, if I can get wireless back. And if not, <coughs> Okay, so a couple other things that I'm gonna talk with you guys about that's great, is why we use Ruby internally for our, so Ruby is one of our big platforms that people actually like, it's been really popular in the cloud space, but when we started, we sort of had this decision of what language are we going to pick to do a lot of our scripting and our orchestration work. When we went through Python and Ruby, we had guys that were putting Perl in there and Bash, uh, and we actually standardized on Ruby for a couple of reasons. One. It, it's exploding in the cloud space, but two, the ecosystem and tools around it have been really impressive for us. So I've got nothing on wireless. I apologize. I'll see if that comes back at all. The, the local wireless seems to be a lot heavier today. Local wireless? Okay, let me see. That's the town pavilion. Town pavilion, I'll switch over to that. Everybody could just kind of pause here. That's right. Reduce my on-stage pain. This is uh, that happens to me on a monthly basis. But so let's walk through a couple of things there. I'll uh, switch my my demo ordering. So we actually chose to do all of our development in Ruby. Um, we do have some exceptions. Like if you pull down pieces of our code, you'll see it. It's in Bash because that's sort of that lowest level, the simplest thing you could possibly run in a shell. But one of the reasons that we actually chose to standardize on Ruby was the testing capabilities. So we've seen a lot of talks already, like unit testing, those things are, are pretty amazing. But one of the things that we liked was the web testing capabilities. And how many people have used Selenium? No Selenium? How many people hate Selenium from like two years ago, using Selenium RC, have scars from that? At least so. So that was my, my world. And actually, Selenium WebDriver has come out. And Selenium WebDriver, coupled with the headless Ruby gem, coupled with things like XBFB and a bunch of other things, has been phenomenal for us. So hopefully, let's see if I, if I get wireless, I'm walking through a quick demo of this, but uh, I would really recommend checking out Selenium WebDriver. Their Ruby bindings are pretty good. They're not perfect, but for us to actually be able to code in Ruby, do our site, our site's just a Rails 3 site, and then actually do all of our Selenium testing in Ruby has been nice. Now, Headless, 
I didn't even know about this Ruby gem until about six months or so ago. And the reason we use headless is we do a lot of work in the public cloud. And for us, that actually means you, you, know, you get a little accustomed to like you have X running or you have a graphics you know, desktop environment running. But when you're trying to run Selenium tests in Amazon or in another provider, you don't have video. You still want to get screenshots. You don't want your you know, text and fonts to look crazy. Uh, headless is actually simplifies standing up a virtual frame buffer environment in a provider like Amazon where it's awesome. You can actually now offload your tests, run them on Amazon, take the screenshots, bring them back down to your local laptop, and it is about the simplest way to get all that running. That link at the bottom, I actually have a blog post because I was like, I can't get through all the details of stuff, but I wanted to show you sort of the basics of what this looks like, and then um, also what we have expanded to. So if we look at a, what a, um, Selenium WebDriver headless on the rough of lines. Code looks like for us, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's basically a native Ruby looking class where we do have a couple methods like go to home, but this test is basically our way to check logging in and making sure that it works and that when you actually log out, you destroy the cookies, that things are gone. So if you look at a couple of things here, um, the screenshot functionality is there. You can actually use dri their driver capability to do things like manipulate cookies. And then probably the last line is one of the most powerful ones for us of checking elements via XPath constructs to say, okay, once I've actually done this, this element better be there or better not be there. Uh, now, probably the big question is, you know, like, great, Matt, this was solved 10 years ago, right? Why do you care about Selenium and web testing? And for us, it's been really from HTML5. So our, the ability to like build a standard site, you can, you can trust pretty much CSS and those things today, but the minute you make the jump into HTML5 and say, okay, I'm gonna use some native functionality, I'm really gonna push the envelope with this, your ability to test on Windows, as much as like we hate IE, it can't look terrible on that, and then on Mac and on Safari and on Linux and Chrome, your OS and your browser matrix gets really complicated. So that was sort of the second thing for us is we started with this and we started in EC2 and EC2 pretty much does Linux stuff well um, and you can cover Linux and Firefox, Linux and Chrome. And so the second thing we expanded to was using Sauce Labs for Selenium. So if you've actually, you've got your investment in Selenium, you're using WebDriver, you're testing in Ruby, it's great, you love it, but standing up all those different operating systems and different levels and different browsers is a pain. So we actually offloaded a lot of that to Sauce Labs, which I'll show you um, internally as well. So let me see if, uh, if I have wireless. Oh, I do. Does someone have uh, a pavilion and a TP as the password? Right. Yes, sir. So I'll show you a quick cache view of what Sauce Labs does, and then we'll see if this actually works. So Sauce Labs, we did have to tweak our Ruby Selenium test a little bit. Things we loved about it, it let us actually keep our tests in Ruby. Uh, two, they deal with the pain of, you can actually see this is Windows 2003 and Firefox 3.6. That is a very thankless job to have a variety of operating systems and a variety of browsers to be able to test on. And then they did some really nice stuff, which, dare I refresh this. But you can see this video, <coughs> let's go click on it right now, but actually as you run your test, they not only do the virtual frame buffer stuff where you can grab screenshots, but they'll actually take a video of your entire test. Let's see if this comes up. You said wireless was peppy. Here. Okay, yeah. Video is probably not going to work. But um, they break down everything that you did. So if you're, you know, if you have a photographic memory, you can compare this with that old test. They basically, everything that you run through, break out, take screenshots at every point, and actually do the video. So it is a great expansion to if you bought off on Ruby, you're doing your testing in Ruby, you love the WebDriver stuff, you're actually using Headless, 
but then you're really tired of trying to stand up like Windows and Windows licenses and EC2, Sauce Apps is a great next step to go there. So, um, let's see if we can actually get our Rails app running. Okay. Go over here. We'll see if our app is running. And I'm not sure how much time. Ten minutes. Okay. So this is, if we back up into the demo, we created this application as a rack application. Um, it's live, you guys can go look at it in your browser. You can tell this is rack by the famous, uh, I'll put in the, uh, the lobster. You can see your lobster, man, you can flip it, you can crash it. Um, Sure, no, that's that's your rack application. So that's usually our starting point for uh, for applications. If you guys don't know rack, we, uh, that enjoys us a lot. Uh, we enjoy that a lot. So the next thing we're going to look at is how we would actually upgrade that to a real application. Because uh, now I know this is not going to work, so I'm going to show you guys a command. I can guarantee you it's not going to finish. But we actually use GitHub a ton. I like Zach's presentation yesterday. You can go, you look at GitHub.com/openshift. A ton of our quick starts for like this, plus a bunch of other things are there, which I'm gonna show you two lines of git magic that you run, which basically says like, take my repo here and make it that repo there. And then you git push it, and you'll watch, you know, basically all the gems get downloaded, runs. Um, so what that is, is if I go to my directory and I look at this, we can see it's basically just a rack application. It's your config RU, uh, not too exciting. Now I'm going to run these two magic git commands. We'll see if it works. So this first one is saying, OK, I want to add a new upstream master to my repository that is going to take a repository that I host on GitHub. It's good for a little sample apps. And the second command says, you guys know git, pull recursive, any conflicts, use what he's got instead of what I've got. And then, um, then it works. Now I'm going to copy over a couple files because this actually uses um, the pusher service to do web service based stuff. So you'll see I copy my credentials over here, and then I get commit and I get push. So what's going to happen now is we've actually changed a lot of stuff in this application. We've changed the gems that are required because it's not rack anymore. It's actually got to pull down the whole rail stack. Uh, we pull in gems from um, the company pusher web sockets company, and you basically want to get it all up and running. So I doubt this is going to finish. We'll see how lucky I am. But um, it's going to push that to the server. You basically wait a couple minutes for your gems to get deployed. And then that app will be running with a new Rails app. And I'll actually show you what that app will look like in my um, kitchen show style replacement. Because I do this enough that. I always know I'll take X amount of pain up on stage. But you will basically see when that command finishes, you have a Rails application. Uh, it's pretty neat, actually, we did this as a JavaScript example of how you can use WebSockets, push event-driven data from the servers, and then receive it on the command line on a WebSocket and manipulate little JavaScript things. So if you start this, you look at the debugger, you will see pusher events that come down. <coughs> And you'll see the memories there. And you can do things like eat memory. And it'll nicely change. But you know, that's basically the application. But it's a nice way to go from simple rack application to I have my fancy Rails application. One of the nice parts is if you deal purely in Ruby, that's good. But a lot of us in the IT world, we have to deal with Ruby and probably like PHP, probably some Java there, and probably a bunch of other things. And our goal has been to keep the experience and the lifecycle experience completely consistent. So if you're having to deal with Java, I still code in Vim for Java. Compilation and Maven dependencies and all those things happen server side in the deployment. It's basically the same way I do my Ruby deployments. Um, we have a lot of quick starts that are up there. So the last piece, because I know I'm running out of time with this, my, uh, that I wanted to talk about that's been a challenge for us, and we think there's a great project out there that we've liked a lot, is, um, 
with a lot of machines to deal with now. So one of the good parts about cloud offerings is you can get machines pretty quick. Right? You can get 100 machines in a second if you want. The bad part about it is they're a little bit volatile. So like uh, those that know Amazon, like EBS is sort of painful sometimes. It just drops off the face of the earth. And you have to be able to manage your machines pretty differently than how you would manage them in a data center. So for us, we actually use the Implective project. Um, anyone familiar with that? You used Puppet before? So this is something that you wouldn't see if you were using OpenShift, but it's something we use behind the scenes. Implective actually uses messaging technology behind the scenes to be able to subscribe, do operations, do controlled operations on your machines, um, and be able to query them, pull facts back, if you're familiar with Factor, and it lets us make a lot of decisions like, what is the best machine that is in the right state to take the next application? So we have a lot of machines out there, they're changing state all the time. Our users are very volatile with them. And Collective has provided a great messaging based way to actually query that infrastructure real time and then do operations like deployment for it. We actually took the Collective backend out and replaced it with AMQP and Apache Cupid instead of Stomp, which it uses. That was another thing we loved about it is they're actually, they use messaging but they're disconnected enough to where we could replace with the stack they were most comfortable. So with that, that's what we do. I apologize for the shaky live demo. That always hurts my heart a little bit. And then the, uh, the quick tools, I like to uh, Creative Commons, all the pictures, Creative Commons, fantastic place to get presentation pictures. All the slides done in Inkscape and the fancy HTML5 <coughs> stuff in Sozi. Um, for that, I have like a minute. Any questions or? Okay. Oh, one question, sorry. Sorry, I had a question. Uh, I think you've been misheard, but you were saying sometimes you upgrade uh, like patches and rails and maybe other gems. Yeah, so the gems, the gems are tougher. So we actually always keep a rail stack. It's pretty much tracks with Fedora. Oh, sorry, the question was, uh, do we do updates to things like rails and to gems? Uh, it's been a really challenging space for us because we give users the ability to pick their own gems and deploy that. We do keep an always patched version. So in fact, there were some CVs that came out with Rails recently. So we will keep a Rails like 3.0.11, I think is what we are, um, that's all RPM based. Every dependency is always updated, but you're allowed to deviate from that if you want. And if you deviate, I mean, you pull the gems down from Ruby gems and uh, uh, we have minimal management over that. So. And it's a mixed bag as to how many people use that, because people like to use the bleeding edge based gym stuff. But uh, one of the nice things is the interpreter itself. So we aggressively actually keep the interpreter patch and lip -see and all the things below it, um, just you know, track with realm. So. Yeah. One more. So when you fired up those servers there during the demo, were those living on Amazon or your own? Well, we host, most of what you would see hosted is hosted in Amazon today. Uh, probably what, it, it's tough, we like to reserve the right to like, we'll pick the best hosting that works for us. Um, Amazon is really good right now. So we, we do a mixed bag of where we host, but most of our end user application space is hosted in Amazon. Uh, one of the reasons we do that is a lot of services like our Yes or other things that are there are co-located within Amazon. So that's been the uh, preferred user choice of where we spend stuff on. That's it? Okay. Thank you, guys.